Supply chains have been strained since the start of the pandemic, and the recent conflict between Russia and Ukraine could bring them to the brink of breaking point. Against this backdrop, supply chain solutions have become more important than ever. And when it comes to cryptocurrency, the top supply chain crypto project is none other than VeChain. Today, I'm going to briefly explain what VeChain is, bring you up to speed on some of the project's most important updates, and see whether VET and VETHO are about to go vertical. I hate to interrupt, but going on without a disclaimer could get me locked up. I'm not a financial advisor, so if that's what you came here for, you're out of luck. Education and entertainment are the only things I discuss. Please contact a financial advisor if your crypto portfolio is corrupt. If this is your first time on my crypto block, my name is Guy and I am a crypto jock. I create high quality crypto content that's so good it'll leave you in shock. Coins, tokens, news, reviews, and sometimes stuff that's related to stocks. If you want to join the flock, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell to secure your spot. If you're behind schedule, the timestamps below will be a useful tool. Just remember that watching the whole way through will help this video get shown to others like you. Now that you know what I do, let's see what VeChain has been up to. If you're not very familiar with VeChain, here's a quick rundown. VeChain was founded in 2015 by electrical engineer Sunny Liu. VeChain was created by VeChain Tech, a software company based in China. VeChain's development is coordinated by the VeChain Foundation, a nonprofit based in Singapore. VeChain raised $20 million in a 2017 ICO, and its main net went live in the summer of 2018. VeChain's blockchain is called VeChain Thor, and it's actually a modified fork of Ethereum's blockchain that's been optimized for supply chain solutions. In contrast to Ethereum, VeChain doesn't use proof of work or proof of stake. Instead, it uses a consensus algorithm called proof of authority whose creation is credited to Ethereum co-founder and Polkadot founder Gavin Wood. Rather than computing power or stake, Proof of Authority chooses which network participant produces a block based on reputation. Now, VeChain currently has 101 authority nodes which process all transactions on its blockchain, and any prospective authority nodes must apply with and be approved by the VeChain Foundation. In addition, Authority nodes must stake a minimum of 25 million VET, which is used for staking and governance. VET has a maximum supply of 86.7 billion, all of which has technically vested. In exchange for staking VET and processing transactions, authority nodes earn VETHO, which is used to pay for transaction fees on VeChain. VETHO has no maximum supply. Its inflation schedule is periodically adjusted by the VeChain Foundation with the consent of stakeholders and 70% of any VETHO used to pay for transaction fees is burned. To ensure that VeChain isn't too centralized, most of the voting power for any changes to VeChain are held by economic nodes and X nodes, which do not process transactions, but can also earn VETHO for staking VET. Now, this somewhat centralized setup allows VeChain to process around 10,000 transactions per second, which is not too shabby at all. I will quickly note that this impressive statistic doesn't apply to smart contract transactions since VeChain leverages the Ethereum virtual machine, whose TPS is capped at around 300. VeChain currently has around 70 decentralized applications, which can be accessed via the VeChain Sync desktop wallet. To ensure that the VeChain Thor blockchain doesn't get too bloated, all decentralized applications and tokens are approved by VET holders and the VeChain Foundation. Minimal bloat is important because VeChain has more of an institutional orientation, where performance is paramount. Whereas retail users interact with VeChain via VeChain Sync, institutional users interact with VeChain via the VeChain Toolchain. VeChain has secured multiple institutional partnerships, mostly with Chinese subsidiaries of multinational corporations, including retail giant Walmart, pharmaceutical giant Bayer, Big Four accounting firm PricewaterhouseCoopers, and of course, the Chinese government. Now, if you want to learn more about VeChain's background and how it works, you can check out my previous video about the project using the link in the description.
Now, it's been basically a year since I last covered VeChain, so it's safe to say that a lot has happened since then. Here are some of the highlights. Last April, the VeChain Foundation launched a $1 million grant program to encourage the adoption of VeChain's Enterprise NFTs, or ENFTs for short. In June, VeChain partnered with a Chinese hospital to track the process of in vitro fertilizations, and I must admit that the video promoting this partnership was a bit creepy. In July, VeChain partnered with the Republic of San Marino for a similarly spooky purpose, and that was for a blockchain based pandemic health passport using VeChain's ENFTs. Interestingly, Sonny Liu explained in a presentation that VeChain's pandemic health passports actually offer way more privacy than the ones being pushed by European governments, which he claims are violating European data protection laws and are using the pandemic as their justification for doing so. In August, VeChain released a tool to help Chinese companies track their carbon emissions in accordance with China's goal to become carbon neutral by 2060. In September, the Chinese arm of PricewaterhouseCoopers revealed a tool called AirTrace, which uses VeChain Thor to track air quality in Chinese cities. A report released in September also found that VeChain Thor is one of the most eco-friendly cryptocurrency blockchains on the market, though it didn't show how VeChain stacks up against other cryptos. In November, the VeChain Foundation accelerated the project's pivot to sustainable development by hiring a former CTO of Big Four accounting firm Deloitte to head its new division that's focused on achieving the United Nations' sustainable development goals. VeChain also completed its highly anticipated Proof of Authority 2.0 upgrade, and it consisted of three major components. First, it introduced verifiable randomness as part of the process to select which authority node produces a block. Secondly, it modified the block producing process to make it next to impossible for VeChain Thor to fork. And thirdly, it sped up block finality on VeChain Thor, which apparently increased its transactions per second, though I couldn't find an updated TPS figure. Now, on that note, if you're curious about how TPS is calculated and which cryptocurrencies are the fastest, you can find out using the link in the description. Anyways, as a cherry on top, the first decentralized exchange deployed on VeChain in November, and it currently has around $20 million in total value locked. That's not much, but remember that VeChain's focus isn't DeFi. In December, VeChain partnered with the government of Inner Mongolia to track and trace agricultural products. In January this year, VeChain launched the VUSD stablecoin in conjunction with a regulated fintech startup based in the United States called Stably. Now, if that didn't give it away, VUSD is a centralized stablecoin like Circle's USDC or Paxos's USDP, meaning every VUSD in circulation is backed by US dollars sitting in a bank associated with Stably. Grayscale also revealed that it was considering creating trusts for 25 cryptocurrencies, including VET. This suggests that there may be strong institutional demand for VET in the United States. In February, the VeChain Foundation set up a new headquarters in the Republic of San Marino and will work with the government there to achieve its mission of making San Marino the first carbon neutral country in conjunction with the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. More about that later. Shortly afterwards, VeChain revealed an upcoming platform called vCarbon, which will make it possible to track both individual and institutional carbon emissions and will eventually allow for carbon emissions trading. As far as I understand, vCarbon has yet to be released. In March, the minting portal for VeChain's VUSD stablecoin was opened to the public, making it possible for anyone to mint or redeem VUSD with actual USD. According to VeChain stats, about 5 million VUSD have been minted so far, which is not bad for one month. This might have to do with all the minting incentives offered by the VeChain Foundation. Billionaire venture capitalist Tim Draper also partnered with VeChain to launch the VeChain Web3 Accelerator program in association with Draper University, Tim's educational enterprise. Fun fact, Tim is actually one of the richest crypto holders out there, and he owes much of his early success to investing aggressively in the Chinese stock market when it was first getting off the ground. You can learn more about Tim and the other top crypto billionaires by using the link in the description.
Anyhow, as amazing as all VeChain's developments, updates, announcements, and partnerships have been, VET has been having a hard time as far as price goes. This is for a few reasons. For starters, BTC is still recovering from its November crash, and as an altcoin, VET is highly correlated to BTC. For what it's worth, VET is in roughly the same territory as most other altcoins for the time being. While it's certainly nice to see that VET is in a long term uptrend, it looks like VET has been setting lower highs since the crypto crash last May. This might have to do with the fact that the May crash was caused by China's crackdown on crypto mining, and China's clampdown on the industry has only accelerated since then. This is bad news for VeChain because China is where the project has secured most of its partnerships, and it's also where the software company behind VeChain is based. The good news is that VeChain seems to be expanding its presence outside of China. The VeChain Foundation's new European headquarters and the VUSD stablecoin supports this idea. The bad news is that VeChain's adoption doesn't exactly translate to increased demand for VET because it's only used for staking and governance. Of these two fundamental demand drivers, staking is probably the most dominant, and the bad news there is that the minimum stake to become an economic node or X node that earns a meaningful amount of VETHO isn't all that affordable for the average person. The good news is that VET staking can be done through select third party wallets and exchanges. But the bad news there is that VET staking rewards through third party wallets and exchanges are low, with Exodus only offering around 1% per year. Still better than a bank, though that hardly says much. This leaves speculation as the only other demand driver for VET, and I suspect most of this speculation comes from VET's low price tag and the belief that there's big money to be made if it reaches a dollar. The issue with this angle is that VET has very limited exchange support in the United States, and this means it doesn't get nearly as much exposure as other low price tag cryptos. As I've mentioned many times before, it's not the price tag that matters, but the market cap. And the good news there is that VET has a medium sized market cap. The bad news is that VET's actual market cap is probably much larger, since VET's entire supply technically finished vesting. In the summer of 2019. The good news is that the VeChain Foundation team and select investors haven't sold nearly as much as you'd think, but that might be because VET's price isn't that far off from its ICO price. Unfortunately, there's bad news there too. That's because VET's circulating supply has increased by almost 2 billion over the last year, which is still big bucks if you do the maths and assume that additional supply was sold. And VeChain's aggressive expansion suggests it was. The good news is that CoinGecko suggests VET's supply hasn't increased at all over the last year, but I have a feeling that any VeChain nodes operating in China were forced to sell their VET because of the government's crackdown on the industry. It's a similar story for VeChain's VETHO, which seems to be in less of a long term uptrend and has likewise been setting lower highs over the last year. As I mentioned earlier, VETHO is used to pay for transaction fees on VeChain, and 70% of transaction fees on VeChain are burned. VeChain stats suggest VeChain is seeing about half as many daily transactions as it was a year ago. The charts page on VeChain stats was actually down during my research, so I couldn't get the full picture, but I did manage to find another website called CVeChain, which gives a detailed history and breakdown of VETHO burns over the last year. I'll leave a link to it in the description if you're interested. As you can see, VETHO burns have been on a steady decline, and this means that transactions on VeChain Thor have been on the decline, though there do seem to be some early signs of a recovery. The bad news is that more than half of the demand for VeChain Thor seems to be coming from Walmart China, and this demand isn't all that high either. It's only about a few hundred dollars per day. The worst news is VETHO's circulating supply has increased by almost 30% over the last year. And it's reasonable to assume that most of this supply was sold, since it's how VeChain nodes make their money. To make matters even worse, the change in VETHO's circulating supply is the same on both CoinMarketCap and CoinGecko. This could mean that CoinGecko's account of VeChain's tokenomics is more accurate than CoinMarketCap's, and that means VET's supply has in fact increased by around 2 billion. There is a silver lining to VETHO's current state, however, and that's that it has a relatively small market cap. Not only that, but VETHO 
has a very low price tag too, which makes it catnip for many speculative retail investors. As a matter of fact, Vitho has the second lowest price tag of any crypto listed on Binance US, which is the only US exchange that currently supports it and VET. The crypto with the lowest price tag on Binance US is none other than Shiba Inu, but I have a feeling that lots of retail investors got bitten by that dog during the last run. That means it's quite possible that Vitho will start to pump for purely speculative reasons when the retail hype returns. But be warned that there will probably be a lot of selling from VeChain nodes. Now, if you've ever wondered what Shiba Inu is all about, you can find out using the link in the description. Anywho, whether VET and Vitho can reverse their downward trends ultimately depends on VeChain's upcoming milestones. Although VeChain doesn't have an official roadmap, upcoming milestones can be found in interviews by and presentations with the VeChain team, primarily VeChain founder Sunny Liu. In a Reddit AMA last April, Sunny specified that VeChain is looking to secure more institutional partnerships in Western countries, and so far, this seems to be going according to plan. In a video celebrating VeChain's third anniversary last June, VeChain's developers said that they're working to address transaction history storage issues on VeChain Thor. It's important to point out that this is a problem being faced by just about every cryptocurrency out there, particularly those with a high TPS like VeChain. This means it's quite possible that VeChain will soon be adopting a decentralized storage solution. This is something that Solana did, for example, when it decided to store its blockchain on Arweave. In the same video, another VeChain developer said that they're working on cross-chain solutions, though he didn't specify which chains they're looking to bridge to, nor when these bridges will be complete. In various interviews in the second half of last year, Sunny made it clear that VeChain had officially shifted its focus from supply chain management to sustainable development, specifically the sustainable development goals of the Chinese government and the United Nations. In a recent interview with another crypto YouTuber called Thinking Crypto, Sunny specified the three things that VeChain is looking to accomplish in the short to medium term as part of its new niche. The first order of business is to build a strong team in Europe so that VeChain's environmental experiments can be exported to other countries if they're successful in San Marino. The second initiative is ongoing, and that's VeChain's grants program, which Sunny hopes will attract developers who are interested in making VeChain's new vision a reality. The third aim is upcoming, and that's the series of VeChain accelerator programs hosted by Draper University in the United States. And speaking of Thinking Crypto, you can find out what other crypto YouTubers I watch by using the link in the description. I digress. This brings me to my concerns about VeChain, and I do have a few. I'll start by saying that most of my concerns relate to the extreme pressure VeChain is probably experiencing because of China's crackdown on crypto. As I said in my previous video about the project, VeChain has been dealt the difficult task of balancing the wants and needs of international institutions, Western investors, and the Chinese government. VeChain clearly has a close relationship with the latter, and this means it's probably going to be hard for the project to receive adoption in Western countries, especially since some of them are starting to accuse China of being complicit in Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and are even threatening sanctions. From where I'm standing, it looks like VeChain's pivot to sustainable development is the project's way of walking this increasingly fine line. Western governments are desperate to decarbonize in accordance with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, and the Chinese government has grand plans of its own in that regard. My concern there is that VeChain is using a one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to its track-and-trace tactics. Put simply, what Sonny suggested in his recent interviews is that VeChain wants to create a kind of carbon credit score for both individuals and institutions. This system will not only reward individuals and institutions that act in accordance with the UN's Sustainable Development Goals, but they'll also punish them if they do anything that's not in accordance with these goals. Sonny specified that this would involve, quote, digitizing every behavior and, quote, submitting reports to authorities. And of course, the government will decide what is incentivized and what isn't. Sonny even shared an illustration of what this will look like in one of his aforementioned presentations, and this is exactly what's being rolled out in San Marino as I speak. 
Now, to be fair, this might not be something VeChain is itself pushing for, because the international organizations behind these utopian initiatives have explicitly stated this dystopian system is what they want, and the San Marino government is certainly on the same page there. In any case, it's clear that this isn't a system that the average person is going to embrace voluntarily, and that means VeChain could see a whole new kind of adoption hurdle arise if the project goes down this path. For what it's worth, VeChain has proven that it's willing and able to pivot when adoption starts to decline. VeChain has so far been very successful in its shift in focus, and I foresee additional avenues being opened up by VeChain's grants and especially Draper University's accelerator program. With a bit of luck, new use cases will be created that drive enough demand for VET and VETHO to climb to new all time highs. And if you think VeChain's sustainable development plans are scary, then you probably haven't heard of ESG. You can find out more about that by using, of course, the link in the description. And that's it for today's VeChain update. If you found it informative, smash that like button. If you plan on coming back, subscribe to the channel and ping that notification bell. If you're looking for more from me, check out my second channel called Coin Bureau Clips. I even have a podcast that you can find on most major podcasting platforms like Spotify. If you're addicted to social media, I'm on there too. Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok are a few spots. There's also my Telegram channel, which is perfect if you're struggling to keep up with the crypto market. If you don't have the time for this sort of stuff, then consider subscribing to my weekly newsletter. It's where I reveal my personal crypto portfolio, tell you which cryptos I'll be covering next, and give insider info about what's going on in the crypto market. If you want to make the most of the crypto market, my deals page is the way to go. It's got discounts for everything from exchanges to trading bots, and I guarantee you'll find something that will interest you. Now, you can find your way to all these resources by using the link in the description. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. My name is Guy, and you have been watching The Coin Bureau. Thank you.